This story starts in Rwanda in 1994. Between April and July, hundreds of thousands of Tutsi and moderate Hutu were slaughtered. Images of the genocide spread across the world and shocked the public. However, other than a small number of peacekeepers, no one stepped in to stop the violence. Then US President Bill Clinton, for example, refused to even call it a genocide and decided not to send in troops. In part, this was because Clinton had been humiliated by a failed US military operation in Somalia six months earlier, and because he feared he would take a domestic political hit if he sent the military into another African country. Also, at the time, there was nothing in the UN Charter to allow the UN Security Council to authorize military action in Rwanda. Technically, at that point, the council could only authorize the use of force if international peace and security were threatened. However, the Rwandan genocide only took place in Rwanda and therefore the Security Council had no authority to get involved. Many people were outraged by what occurred in Rwanda and particularly by the fact that the international community did little to stop it. Debate intensified around whether new rules were needed to allow military intervention to prevent other genocides and crimes against humanity in future. Now let's fast forward to the former Yugoslavia in 1999. Once the USA are collapsed, it descended into violence and instability. In particular, Serbian militias began a vicious program of ethnic cleansing against the largely Muslim Albanian population of Kosovo. Because of this, in mid-1999, NATO authorized military action to stop the ethnic cleansing. They deployed troops on the ground while EU forces gathered on the border. The intervention was widely judged to be a success and is credited with saving many thousands thousands of lives in Kosovo. But this was a highly unusual move for NATO, because NATO is meant to be a defensive alliance. According to Article 5 of its charter, NATO responds to a threat to any one of its members. But the former Yugoslavia was not a member of NATO, and neither was Kosovo. So no NATO countries were threatened, yet NATO took action. On top of that, the NATO operation did not receive authorization from the UN Security Council either, mostly because Russia supported the Serbian nationalists and would probably have vetoed any action anyway. Interestingly, this time around, Bill Clinton strongly supported sending in the army to stop the killing. Many people have suggested that Clinton did this in part to redeem himself after the criticism he received for his inaction during Rwanda. Then UN Secretary General Kofi Annan also supported the military intervention in Kosovo. He said that the sovereignty of nations shouldn't be used as a shield against human rights violations. This raised a pretty big problem. How do we balance respect for the sovereignty and independence of countries while still being able to prevent major human rights abuses like genocide. To try and address some of these questions, the Prime Minister of Sweden set up a commission to look into NATO's operation in Kosovo. This commission concluded that the intervention was illegal but legitimate. Illegal because it did not get approval from the UN Security Council, but legitimate because all other diplomatic options had been exhausted, and the intervention succeeded in liberating Kosovars from Serbian rule. In other words, the ends justified the means. This implied that instead of asking for permission and doing nothing, the international community should sometimes break the rules and ask for forgiveness later. However, several countries opposed the intervention and were skeptical of these new norms. An International Commission on State Sovereignty and Intervention was set up in 2002 to look more deeply at these issues. It was here that the phrase responsibility to protect was suggested. This responsibility to protect, or R2P, refers to governments. Governments have a responsibility to protect all people living within their borders from major human rights violations. If they fail to do so, the international community should be allowed to step in and use military force to stop these human rights violations. In 2005, the UN General Assembly voted to accept R2P. Even though the UN is based on a treaty and the General Assembly isn't actually a legislature, this meant that the UN Security Council now had the power to authorize military interventions to protect people from four major human rights violations. These were ethnic cleansing, 
war crimes, crimes against humanity, and genocide. However, R2P doesn't guarantee a right to intervention. In other words, the Security Council may intervene to prevent these four abuses, but nothing in the doctrine says that they must intervene. R2P also applies to all the countries which are members of the UN, whether they voted in support of it or not. Unsurprisingly, this move has been controversial, because now, in effect, what R2P says is that it is legitimate for the international community, as represented by the UN General Assembly and authorized by the Security Council, to intervene in the domestic affairs of a country if it's triggered by one of these four human rights violations. This made for a big change to the rules governing the UN. And not everyone welcomed it. The non-aligned movement, for example, a group of middle-income countries, opposed the adoption of R2P. Others expressed concern that some actors might use R2P as a cover to pursue their own agendas. Despite these lingering questions, the responsibility to protect would be used for the first time in 2011 to authorize NATO's military intervention in Libya with far-reaching consequences.